Okay. Good morning. I'm Connie Haas Zuber, the Executive Director of Arch Inc., Fort Wayne's Historic Preservation Organization. And I would like to welcome you to the Arch Fun and Free Lecture Series for 2001. It's April edition, the historic homes of the Fort Wayne, rich and famous. This talk will be presented by Karen Richards, who is a longtime favorite Arch lecturer. She is a treasured Arch volunteer, a past president of our board, and you may also know her as the Allen County Prosecuting Attorney. We're in the Shields Room at the History Center today, and this um, lecture is being presented to a small audience here, and it is being live streamed, and it is being recorded for presentation later on our website. I need to give some important thanks. First of all, Arches Fun and Free Lecture Series is made possible by the support of our members. And we invite all of you to join us in the good work of historic preservation by visiting our website, archfw.org and clicking the Become a Member button. The lecture series is also supported as part of Arches Community Education Program by grants from Arch United of Greater Fort Wayne and the Community Foundation of Greater Fort Wayne. And we thank them for their support. We also thank the History Center, its director Todd Pelfrey and his staff for making it possible for Arch to present our lecture series in this beautiful and historic Shields room at the center and for making it possible for us to stream the lectures live and record them so we can make them available on our website. Now I would like to turn the, the podium over to our lecturer, Karen Richards, who will take you through the story of the day. There you go, Karen. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the people that came. There is nothing worse in the entire world than lecturing to an empty room. It makes me crazy. So from the bottom of my heart, all my friends and colleagues who are here, thank you so much. Um, people kind of wonder sometimes about how I come up with topics. Well, there's a lot of real interesting stuff on TV today, and people these days have this fascination with the homes of the current rich and famous. So we get to watch on TV blather like uh, Keeping Up with the Kardashians and other such wonderful programs. So I kind of wondered if instead we went back historically, what would we find if we went back and looked in Fort Wayne history to the homes of the historic rich and famous? What would we find and what would some of the accomplishments be of the people that uh, I could showcase? So. Um, I went back and I picked out 10. And if you ask me why I picked out this 10, I will be perfectly honest with you and tell you that they frankly were my 10 favorites. So, you know, they may not be anybody else's favorites, but they're mine. So I picked out 10 that I liked the best. So here we go. I did these in the order in which the house that we're talking about was built. So if you're wondering how, what kind of chronological order I'm doing these in, um, that is the order. The interesting thing about this particular one is Chief Richardville out of all these houses um, was one of the only people actually born in Fort Wayne. As we start through Fort Wayne history, um, obviously um, this was a Native American uh, village and it took a long time for settlers to come. So most of the first people that I'm gonna talk about actually came from someplace else. But as we know, uh, Chief Jean-Baptiste Richardville was born here. And he is the earliest home of Fort Wayne's rich and famous. He built a beautiful home. Here we see a picture and this house is owned by um, the History Center where we are now, just in case you wondered. Uh, he built this beautiful home in 1827. And this house is called a treaty house. And the reason it's called that is pretty simple. Uh, the money to build this house came from a treaty that was signed between the US government and the Miami nation. Um, the treaty was in 1826. And that was a series of treaties, unfortunately, that took most of the Miami land away from the Miami and gave it to the US government. Um, at the point in which this treaty happened, um, chief Richard Bill was the civil chief of the Miami Indians as opposed to like a war chief. He was the civil chief of the Miami Indians until the day he died, and he was the last civil chief of the Miami Indians. 
This house sits in the middle of land that he received by a land grant. And if you ever go to this home, and I would really encourage you to do that, and I'll put a plug in for the History Center. There's a series of events that start at this home. It's starting up soon. You'll have to go on their website in May 1st. Thank you. And there's a series of events that happen here. So the house is open to you, but it's a really interesting home. If you go to the house, you can see that it sits at the very top of all of the surrounding land. It's built on a ridge and it overlooks the portage of the St. Mary's and the Little Wabash River. And it also overlooks the traditional village of the Crane Band of the Miami Indians. So the US government gave money and agreed to build treaty houses for Richard Bill and eight other chiefs. They gave them each $600. Chief Richardville, even by that point, was a wealthy man, and he added $1,600 to that amount of money, and he built a home that was truly spectacular for its time. Um, this was a time when if people had homes at all, they were log cabins. Folks were still living uh, in little tents and lean-tos, and the Miami Indians were living in their more traditional homes. And so when this home was built, it had French wallpaper, French drapes, oriental carpets, chandeliers, and an elaborate gold clock um, on the mantelpiece. Uh, if you look at the photo on the upper left, that is actually Chief Richardville's bedroom. If you look right there, you will see the spindle. That was actually his bed. Uh, that the History Center has, and the room farther down is one of the downstairs rooms. The shape of this house, and I'm going to go back, the shape of this house is called an eye house, and what that means is it has, I love these little laser pointers, um, it has, there it is, it has side gables. This is a gable right here, so it has one of those on each end, and it's a house that is two rooms across and either one or two rooms uh, behind that. And it has a little L or a little extension in the back and those were built as either extra storage room or as a kitchen. And, and in this particular house, it is indeed a kitchen. The style, the architectural style of this house is called Greek Revival. And you'll see that for the next few houses, they're all Greek Revival homes. Uh, this particular home, has a really lovely, you see the surround around the um, front door, and it has really nice gable returns. Gable returns are these little guys right here, and it has a beautiful freeze board underneath uh, the gutters. And so if you really look at this house, it may look plain to us, but for the time period and the style, there's really some nice architectural features on this house. And if you go into the house, it is, and the, the stairway will show you, it's, it's called a central hall or a central parlor plan. So you've got a central hall that runs down the middle and then the rooms go over to each side. Um, the other thing that I learned as we went, as I went through putting the research together, at this point in time, all of the movers and shakers in Fort Wayne seem to all be somehow connected to one another. So you'll hear the same names over and over again. So. When you go to the builders of this particular home, it was a guy by the name of A.J. or A.G. Ballard. I have no idea who that is, but the other two were Hugh Hanna and William Rothill. And those names you're gonna hear over and over again. This home is significant because it is one of the only treaty homes left in the entire United States. So um, why was Richardville famous? We know we built a nice home. Why is he famous? He was born in 1816. His mother was the sister of the chief of the Kikianga Miami village. So he came from somewhat royalty. At the time of his death and during a lot of this period of time, he was rumored to be the richest or one of the richest men in the state of Indiana. Um, he profited from the portages, taking your charging for taking your canoe to one river to the other, but he also profited from trade and he was considered one of the elite of early Fort Wayne society. But his real contribution, in my personal opinion, was the advocacy that he had for the Miami Indian tribe. This was a period of time when the government was pretty much, in my personal opinion, stealing every piece of land they could get. 
and doing everything they could to ship every Native American out to horrible pieces of land out west where nobody would live and that where people frankly didn't live because you couldn't live there, there wasn't any means of support. So what Richardville managed to do was negotiate and advocate um, for his people. He was a very uh, shrewd statesman and they maintained their cultural identity and he managed to keep at least some of the Miami Indians still in this particular area when most of them were shipped out to Oklahoma. There is still actually a piece of land in Grant County that has never been owned by the US government ever. It is still owned by the Miami Indian. Um, his name translates to, you know, I've seen so many, I'm not sure what the real personal translation is. Um, it's pronounced something like Pinchwa and it means wildcat, bobcat, something like that. When he died in 1841, the safe that you see here, this is actually his safe, that's his bed. Um, the safe that you see contained $200,000 in gold and silver. Um, his family lived in this home until 1908. A lot of different, um, through, through periods of time, houses change and are added onto and modernized. This home, thanks a lot in the work of the History Center, has been returned pretty much to its 1827 form. It was placed on the National Register in 1997, but it is also, which I think is really important, it is also from 2012, um, a National Historic Landmark, and it's one of the few around here that is. And many thanks to um, Mike Galbraith, and Angie Quinn for doing the nomination where a lot of this information came. The next house we're gonna talk about is the McCulloch House. And this is a picture of um, Hugh and Susan McCulloch. In my personal opinion, he is probably one of those people that is much better known on a national level than he is on a local level. Although he did quite a bit for our community and in this particular case, I think personally, his wife was an equally important contributor to our community. This house was purchased by Arch in 1978. And this was one basically, I think of our first success stories in historic preservation. Um, you will see as you go through this lecture that a lot of the early homes that we're talking about have been demolished. And that was before people were really interested in historic preservation. The McCulloch House was, on the nat was put on the National Register in 1980. So who is this man? Who is Hugh McCulloch? Um, like I said, a lot of these early folks were not born here. He was born in Maine in 1808. He studied law in Boston and he moved to Fort Wayne in 1833. In 1835, he became the manager of a newly formed bank called the Bank of Indiana. And in getting his jobs here, he actually received a letter of recommendation from Daniel Webster. In 1956, he became this bank's president. His wife, Susan, who he married, was one of the very first, if not the first, school teacher in the settlement of Fort Wayne. She was a really interesting woman. She was an ardent abolitionist, and both in their small log cabin a uh, home that was next to the bank in downtown Fort Wayne and at the mansion that they built. They often hosted abolitionist meetings and some of the people that showed up at those meetings were the Beechers. And you might recognize that name because Beecher is the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. In 1863, because of Hugh's reputation in Indiana banking, he became, or he was asked to become by the Secretary of the Treasury, the controller of the currency. And this was a national job. Um, and so he then moved to DC, left the family in Fort Wayne. In 1865, Hugh McCulloch was asked by President Abraham Lincoln to become the Secretary of the Treasury. And he did become the Secretary of the Treasury. And he held that position both through Abraham Lincoln's um, um, presidency and through the presidency of Johnson and Arthur. He was responsible from a union perspective for finding a way to finance the Civil War. He was also responsible after the war for figuring out how to retire the union debt. 
And he was responsible for reconstruction finance, which if you think about it was a huge job. He was the man responsible for not only joining the United States back together as a country financially, but figuring out how to get money to the Southern states to put them back on their feet because they were pretty much decimated and had never had a good industrial base to begin with. So he is known in the United States, even though we don't know that, this man is known as the father of modern banking. Hugh McCulloch was actually at Abraham Lincoln's deathbed as he died. They were that close. And interestingly enough, he is one of the founders of our Lindenwood Cemetery. So this is a picture. I believe he's already in Washington, DC by the time the above picture is taken. This is his wife, Susan, right here. And this is the original McCulloch Mansion. And I want you to keep in mind what this looks like so you can contrast it with what it looks like now. This particular home was built in 1843 on land purchased from William Rockhill. Uh, McCulloch built this home and it is still standing at 616 West Superior. Again, this is a Greek revival style home and it was designed by one of Fort Wayne's first architects, Henry Williams, who was considered the Southern architect of Fort Wayne. When we go to the next home, he designed that as well. At the time, this particular house, this is the front lawn right here. The front lawn would reach all the way down to the Wabash and Erie Canal. The back of the home would reach all the way to the river. And it was a huge front and back lawn. The original house, had a porch on one side and a greenhouse on the other. And the columns that we see right here are square. It also had, there it is, the nice cupola on the top of um, the home. It had a beautiful yard with fruit trees, grape arbors and gardens and the entire thing was enclosed by a white picket fence. Um, over the years, the house has been modernized. As you can see, this is how it looks today. These particular columns have been changed from square columns to round columns, but these two sides, which were once a porch and a greenhouse have now been totally enclosed. So the house looks much different. I wanna talk about Susan for a minute because in her own way, I find her equally important. When she moved to Fort Wayne, she frankly was shocked by what people were eating. Basically what people in this community ate was what they could shoot or what they could gather. There really was no indigenous growing of anything much um, other than what Native Americans had, had taught the white settlers to grow. And she was astounded by that. She had come from New York State, which as we all know is full of uh, fruit trees, gardens, etc. So she made it her job to continue to travel back to New York and bring nursery stock and garden stock to Fort Wayne. She is responsible beginning in 1841 for bringing the first cherry trees, peach trees, plum trees and pear trees to the city of Fort Wayne. And she would supply all her friends. And so we'll talk about that in a couple of houses to also local farmers. So she also supplied a gentleman by the name of Frank Randall, who became the future mayor of Fort Wayne, she supplied him with the trees that he put on his farm, the Randall farm, which is now located where the VA hospital and park you are located. And the Randalia Drive is actually a derivative of Frank P. Randall's name. Um, the McCulloughs finally did um, move from this mansion. It eventually became the College of Medicine in Fort Wayne from 1892 to 1905. And if you have ever been on one of our ghost tours, you will find that this mansion has a ghost story that is associated with it. And I'm not telling you that because you have to go on the ghost tour. Um, next is Hannah. This is Samuel Hannah. If we wanna talk about anybody that we consider to be the founder of the city of Fort Wayne, I would consider this man and many others do as well as the founder of the city of Fort Wayne. He is a man of, of a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. I think at his time, he was thought of very positively, but as we put on today's glasses, I think we probably see him in a much different light. Again, like the people I've talked about, he was born elsewhere. 
He was born in Kentucky in 1797. He moved to Fort Wayne in 1819 at age 22 when he was a trader. He died in 1960, or, I'm sorry, 1866. By the time he died, he was considered one of the most respected men in the city because of his lifetime of accomplishments. When he moved here again, Fort Wayne was a very primitive place. The army left the same year that he uh, moved here in 1819. And he set up a trading post. It was a log store at the corner of Bar and Columbia. And at the corner of Bar and Columbia, we now find the Arts United Center. That's about where his store was. Um, he became successful as a trader, even though he had great difficulty getting goods into the city. So he made it his job to make Fort Wayne a more sophisticated and a more accessible town. He knew that if settlers were going to come and trade goods were going to come, um, they needed to be able to access Fort Wayne. And the problem is this entire area was a swamp. And if you just do nothing but look out the window and I'm directionally challenged, so I believe it's right here, right in front of the History Center, this is all swamp. This was all swamp back then. In fact, if you go on one of our ghost tours, we indeed tell a ghost story about the swamp that was located right in front of the History Center and the Barrett and McNagney Electron Building. So what he wanted to do was to build a plank road system. And what a plank road system is, is basically exactly what it sounds like. You take wooden planks, you lay them down, and that keeps horses, buggies, et cetera, out of the mud when it rains and out of the swamp. So he is responsible for the first road system in Fort Wayne. The first one he built was the Lima Plank Road, which is where Lima Road is. Uh, the second was the Pequa Road, which is Calhoun Street. And the third was the Goshen Road Plank Road. He was our first postmaster. Uh, he became a circuit court judge. He became a member of the state legislature. And through his position in the state legislature, he helped create the Erie Canal, made sure that it was routed through Fort Wayne and actually assisted with its construction. At some point, obviously you're moving into your next transportation system and it became clear that the Erie Canal was not um, going to be sufficient to continue to grow this town. So the railroad came into being. And originally the railroad was going to bypass Fort Wayne, which made uh, Samuel Hanna extremely nervous. So he led a drive to provide the funds to make sure the track came into Fort Wayne to ensure that we had a railroad. Thus, he is considered the father of our local railroad system. He also made sure that we had the repair location um, and construction shop in Fort Wayne that served the railroad industry for over 100 years, and that brought Fort Wayne into the industrial age. Um, in addition to the good things that I've just talked about, he was known to be a pretty ruthless businessman. Um, he was responsible um, for taking advantage of a lot of local Native American people. He was very interested in owning their land and he was successful in doing that. He once boasted that he could go from Fort Wayne to Indianapolis, from Lafayette to Anderson, and feed his horse in a corn crib that he owned every single night of his stop. So this is the Hannah Homestead. This is the home um, that Samuel Hannah built. He built this home two years after the McCulloch Mansion. This is 1845. And he used the exact same architect, Henry Williams. This again is a Greek revival style home. And if you know where Hannah uh, Homestead Park is, this in the 1840s was farmland. This was way, way, way outside of town. Uh, the address became known as 1002 East Lewis, and it became the center of social life in Fort Wayne. Hannah was very involved in the planning of this house. He wanted a beautiful main hallway with Greek columns in it, black walnut stairs and woodwork and marble mantelpieces, and he got what he wanted. This house is actually built with a large central hallway, and it has two matching porticos right here, and right here. And so then there's a wing of rooms on each, was on each side of this uh, home. It had six large columns in the front. 
Those columns were each 40 feet tall. There were four acres of ground surrounding it. And he had 13 children in this home, only one of which Eliza was a girl. Now, the one thing, and this is for Laura, because Laura likes this the best. The thing that Henry Williams was known for, and it's kind of hard to tell, but it is the lovely little work um, on the newel post of the stairs. And every single Henry Williams home has that. It is his signature, it is his trademark. Um, Greek Revival, oops, I'm sorry. Greek Revival style again. Um, you can see the really nice pedimented work over the doors. I like the one on the right because it's just a little drawing from back then of what the home looked like. So um, Hannah lived in that home um, until his death. And then after he died, his daughter Eliza and her husband lived in the home. They lived there until 1937. She gave the home to our local Fort Wayne community school system and asked if possible that it never be torn down. However, she stupidly did not make that request and that was not agreed to in writing. Eventually, as we can see on the left, uh, the home became a school for the physically handicapped until 1962, uh, but the school system, big surprise, allows, allowed it to deteriorate and it was demolished to become a park. This is a colored um, postcard. I don't think this is Randy's because um, Randy has so many wonderful postcards. But anyway, this is a postcard um, of what the house uh, looked like. What became of Samuel Hanna? Well, Samuel, Samuel Hanna died June 11th, 1866. In his honor, every bell in every church in Fort Wayne told at the exact same time his funeral procession passed. All the principal buildings in Fort Wayne were draped in black and there was a two mile long funeral pr procession that took his body to be buried in Lin Lindenwood Cemetery. And as a plug for our dearly departed Lindenwood Cemetery tours, uh, this particular obelisk is often featured on our cemetery tours. This guy's one of my very favorites and nobody knows who he is and I love this guy. Um, this is Franklin P. Randall. This guy is a Renaissance man. He has so many different interests and talents. I find this guy just fascinating. Um, he was born in 1812 in Lenox, New York. He became a lawyer, he moved to Fort Wayne. Now his goal was to advance the interests of our city through public service. And he had various government positions, including being elected as a state senator. But he became best known as Fort Wayne's Civil War mayor. He was mayor during the Civil War. And as a person who's been elected to office five times, I can tell you how hard that is. And this guy was elected mayor five terms. He was elected in 1959. I'm sorry, 1859, 61, 63, 69, and 71. But it is his home, which did stand at 409 East Berry, that uh, I think was truly a treasure. And if you look out the window, I think it's that way, that way. If you look out the window that way, it sat at the corner of Barry and Lafayette. There is kind of a semi-abandoned AT&T building um, that, that sits now where that house sat, but it had that entire area. So he built this home that we see in 1868. It was considered one of the largest in Fort Wayne. And this is his family out front. It's a different uh, style than the others. This is an Italianate style. It was mostly wood. This house was so loved by Franklin Randall that when it burned down in 1873, he built the exact same house in the exact same place in it, right there on the, on the lot. Um, it was an exact duplicate. Now, this house was known for two things. And this is, he's not in the picture, but that is four generations of Randall 
in the picture on the right. If you're very interested in this guy, his family has taken their entire photo album and donated it to the Allen County Public Library. And if you go on digital photos, there's just a ton of pictures. They're really cool. Anyway, um, let's see if this, yep, this is what I want. This again is his home. This house was known for two important things. Number one, this house was known for his garden. And you kind of have to look at the pictures up here and down here, but mostly up here. This guy would either travel to Central America or send to Central America for exotic species of plants, trees, etc. And his front yard was filled with palm trees and all kinds of beautiful things that he was importing from Latin America. Um, he had a farm, as I've talked about, the Randall Farm on Randalia. And it was here that many of the fruit trees that Susan McCulloch brought to the city were planted. Um, the Randall home, this house was also known for its place in the social circle of Fort Wayne. Um, it became the location of many lavish parties, probably the biggest of which was the celebration that folks did around New Year's. Now everybody celebrates on New Year's Eve. Back in the 1800s, the celebration was on New Year's Day. And so what people would do is they would go from party to party to party during the day from house to house, and they would end up at a lavish dance that would last into the next day at night. And so for the people that were the movers and shakers of Fort Wayne, the nighttime party was always held at the Randall's home. In fact, this was party central. His house became known as the Grand Hall because of the elaborate parties that he would have. Um, I found a little quote um, from the Sentinel newspaper during his time. And it reported that ladies blossomed in satins, rare laces, and elegantly richly colored velvets, wearing diamonds, pearls, and other jewels. Uh, the party that he held had food and dancing and live music. And it was reported that most of his parties ended at about 2 a.m. So what else did he do? And this, before I leave, this is the greatest picture of him. There's his top hat in hand. But look at the palm trees and the other things that are in the front yard of his home and how pretty that little greenhouse is on the side. Um, but the other thing that Randall did that we don't know about is this is the man that wrote our first city charter, the charter that was adopted by the legislature in 1840. But the other thing that he did, you will see this seal everywhere in city government. Franklin P. Randall invented and made that seal. It is designed with, let's see, it's got two snakes, scales of justice, uh, the swords, the kikianga. And so that is the Fort Wayne City Seal to this very day. Um, unfortunately, like so many of the other houses we're talking about, his home was demolished in 1950. And the building that is there now is what's there now. Next, uh, John Klaus Peters. John Klaus Peters is famous in West Central because of his house. It is truly a fabulous house. It still stands. It's at 832 West Wayne. He's also uh, really famous for his granddaughter. But what most people don't know about John Klaus Peters is he was the hero of women all over the world in the 1800s. This man was actually, other than Chief Richardville, the first of all these people to actually have been born in Fort Wayne. He was born in Fort Wayne in 1848, his parents having come from Germany where a lot of uh, folks came from at that point. His very first business was the Peters Lumber Company. But it wasn't until he partnered with a guy called Dr. Horton in Bluffton and bought a model that Horton was perfecting that he truly came into himself. Between he and Horton and his, who I discovered half brother, Henry Paul, they work together and put together the first 
self-contained mechanical washing machine in the world. That is how Peters distinguished himself. He first planned to manufacture this washing machine um, at his lumber company. Um, that did not work. So he transferred that interest into a company that became known as the Horton Washing Machine Company. And by 1924, this company in Fort Wayne, Indiana supplied over one half of the washing machines in the entire world. Um, on my right uh, is a model of one of those very first washing machines. And as you walk down the grand staircase in the history center, make a left, right Todd, make a left. And all along that wall, you will see the succession of Horton washing machines. I, I don't think I can emphasize to you enough the difference that this made in people's lives, mostly women, because they were the ones doing the wash. At the point in time that this washing machine came into being, People were washing clothes in a big old tub with a scrub board and that's how your and a bar of soap and that's how your clothes were being washed. So this particular invention saved women hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of time. Um, and again, I, I found it interesting that he was partners with a guy by the name of Henry Paul. And when I looked him up and went to Linden, Lindenwood Cemetery, they actually were half brother sharing the same mother. And uh, I looked at their gravestones just to confirm that. Anyway, um, the other thing that people don't know about this guy is he also was one of the people that began development on the landing, taking it from a much more crude trading offloading of goods kind of location to a place where people can really go. In 1887, he built the Wayne Hotel which became one of the most prestigious and beautiful hotels in Northeast Indiana. It boasted the very first hydraulic barber chair, and it had as its guests, Presidents Benjamin Harrison, James Garfield, and Rutherford Hayes. Now, we all know this hotel because it was built onto, expanded, and became the Rose Marie. Now, the Rose Marie, as we all know, um, the landing was hit by an arsonist in the early to mid 1970s. This hotel burned in 1975. So there is another piece, uh, a picture of the fretwork on the Rosemary, but to the right of that is the house we all recognize from West Central and it is the John Klaus Peters house. Um, Peters hired an architect by the name of John Wing. We will know John Wing's work because he designed the building. He was the architect that designed the building we're sitting in now. He designed the History Center. Um, but this is a Queen Anne style home. It is built at 832 West Wayne in 1885. And there John Klaus Peters and his wife Mary raised seven children. Um, this house is probably one of the most elegant in West Central. It was placed on the National Register. And I think a cl really close look at this home, it has some absolutely gorgeous details. It has some of the finest stained glass windows and the beautiful curved arches are not only over the entryway, but there's a little balcony under that gable right here with the arch. It truly is a lovely home. So sometime take a walk down into West Central um, and take a peek at this home. As those of you who are old movie buffs know, uh, Peter's son married a woman by the name of Bess Knight. Together they had three children, two boys, one girl, and they lived in a home around the corner on Rock Hill. His granddaughter, the daughter out of that marriage, her name was Jane Alice Peters. She became one of the country's most famous movie stars and when she began her movie career changed her name to Carol Lombard. Charles Sentliver. Charles Sentliver was one of the few people that we talk about that immigrated that isn't from Germany. Um, Sentliver was French. Um, he moved from France to Fort Wayne and I don't think when he moved, anyone would have guessed 
that he is responsible for making Fort Wayne one of the leading beer producers in the Midwest by the end of the 19th century. Um, he uh, established his brewery in 1862 on the banks of the St. Joseph River. Um, not much of anything there remains, but the location is approximately where State and Spy Run meet today. The brewery was originally called the French Brewery, and in its height, it produced 20,000 barrels of beer a year. And there is a picture, an earlier drawing, and in the front, you will see what kind of looks like a canal boat. Um, one of the reasons the brewery was built on the location it was built is it was built on the river. So they had ready access to water, but they also had ready access to transportation. Now, when the brewery and a more modern picture of it is in the lower corner, um, the brewery burned in 1889. Um, and at that point, this brewery was mostly uninsured. Scent Liver spent his own money to rebuild this brewery. Um, and the employees that worked there were so impressed by that act on his part that kept their jobs that they actually, out of their own money, commissioned a statue of scent liver, a bronze statue that stood kind of right, right in here on the brewery. But if you ever go downtown and go to Hall's Gas House and look up on the roof and you see a bronze statue of a guy, and if I remember right, one foot is kind of elevated as if it's on a rock or something, that is that bronze statue of Charles Sentliver that came from this brewery. Um, he eventually owned 28 acres along Spy Run. And I think this is really cool because he turned this 28 acres as you see, and this is not a, an exact drawing, but I like it anyway. It's a drawing of what became Sentliver Park. And what Sentliver Park was, was kind of a beer garden. And families would gather there, they'd have picnics, play sports, listen to music, and of course, drink French brewery beer. You could rent a rowboat. There, there was a waterway behind it. You could rent a rowboat for a dollar a day. Um, and eventually, this was such a big deal that Scent Liver actually started his own railway company. And that's what you see down below with two rail cars, because there were horse-drawn trolleys that would bring people to and from the park. Now they had their own rail cars and it would bring people to the park, but it would also pull beer downtown so that it could be delivered to saloons downtown. And also if they were gonna ship it any place, it would take it to the railroad. But what people don't know about Scent Liver is he also owned his own horse farm called the Spy Run Stock Farm that was located where the Scent Liver Apartments are located now. And it was reputed to have the fastest trotting and pacing horses of the day. They were both uh, raised and trained there. Um, as we all know, it is, it is really tough to survive prohibition. The brewery uh, survived prohibition by becoming an ice company. It was eventually renamed the Old Crown Brewery. And the reason it was named that is their most popular ale was the Old Crown Ale. It's also uh, now the name of one of my favorite coffee locations on Anthony. That's where Old Crown comes from. Um, so in 1886, um, this Queen Anne style home was designed by Wing and Mahurin and it was built for the marriage of Charles's son, Charles F. St. Liver and his bride, Molly. It really has some lovely details. It has this nice uh, third uh, three floor turret right here. Um, it's got a huge um, carriage house. This is the carriage house. Uh, and it really doesn't, you can't really tell how big that thing is from the angle, but this carriage house was so big that you could drive a, a, a carriage through from one end to the other. And people surmise that it probably not only served them as the carriage house for the family, but probably also for the brewery. 
Um, down below, this is a party in that house. Um, I don't think it's any big surprise that I don't see a single female face in the party. Uh, it's all men. Um, but this was a, a scent liver party here. And I think um, all of you know the brewery is now gone. Uh, but what remains is the house. The beer gardens are no more. I think there's a, a fast food burger joint where the gardens used to be. Um, but the house and carriage house still remain and they are a local historic district. There you go. That is this part right here was the office for the brewery. And if you look at the little turret right here, it's very similar to the one that was on the um, Scent Liver home. Um, this particular location right now, I think is a used car dealership um, that sits there right now. The bigger building was the brewery. Next, Carol Lombard. Carol Lombard was born Jane Alice Peters on October 6, 1908 in a house at the corner of Rock Hill and Fiend Drive. Why is she significant? She is significant because she only lived to be, if I did the math right, 34 years old. But in the 34 years that she lived, she became the queen of what was then called screwball comedy, which is basically comedy. Um, but she became, and, and people really don't know this about her, there were years when she was the highest paid actor in Hollywood, period. Um, which I think is incredibly impressive for a kid that grew up a tomboy, uh, played baseball and other ball games in the streets of West Central with her two brothers and the neighborhood boys and attended Washington Elementary School. Uh, one of her favorite memories, and this leads into the lecture I'm giving next, one of her favorite memories of living in Fort Wayne was actually her mother turning their home into a rescue center during the flood of 1913. Um, people could come there, they could get food, they could stay, and it also became a communication center um, because uh, Carol's father was relatively well-to-do being the son of John Klaus Peters, they had one of the few telephones in the entire area. And her life probably would have stayed fairly local, um, frankly, if her parents hadn't gotten divorced. Her parents got divorced when she was six and um, her mother decided she really didn't wanna live there anymore. So she took her three kids and she moved to Hollywood. And when she moved to Hollywood, Carol Lombard had her screen debut at age 12 and at that point, when she was hired by the studio, they wanted her to change her name. And so she picked a couple of names that belonged to friends and hence the name Carol Lombard. Her fortes were comedies. Her probably, um, and if you've never watched it, I dearly, if you like old movies, I dearly adore this movie. It's quirky, funny, and it's called My Man Godfrey. Um, she was married at one point to William Powell, divorced him, but they made this movie together and it is the screwiest movie. It is hilarious. I love it. Uh, you can find it all over the place. I suggest you watch it. Anyway, she got an Academy Award nomination for Best Actress in 1936 for that movie. Um, at the time she was coming into her own, this is dollars from that period of time, she was making about $3,500 a week. By the time her nomination was over with, she was making $450,000 a year. She was the highest paid actor in Hollywood. And back then they had no limits on income tax. Her income tax on her income was 80%. I think everyone knows her, um, at least today, because in 1839, she married Clark Gable. For those of you who are old movie buffs, as we know, Clark Gable is gone with the wind. And this is Clark Gable right there. So she married Clark Gable. They became known as Hollywood royalty. She was known for her beauty, her honesty, being outspoken. And she had a huge knack for swearing like a sailor, which is why I think I'm particularly fond of her. Um, she was a prankster. She used to love to play pranks on uh, producers and directors, 
and did so and was, uh, was really famous for uh, pranking the, uh, the king of the uh, scary movies at the time, Walter Hitchcock. I used to love to play pranks on him. Um, but she's also a really good businesswoman. She was one of the first people in Hollywood that instead of just taking a salary for movies, figured out that it would be more profitable to take a percentage of the earnings of the films. My favorite quote of hers is, although women live in a man's world, they still need to be able to pick the right shade of lipstick. I just, I don't know why I find that funny, I do. Um, one of the things that she was most known for, however, was her work during World War II. Um, during World War II, a lot of actors and actresses promoted the sale of war bonds because that's how we financed World War II. Um, she flew at one point to Indianapolis for a war bond rally and raised $2 million in one night. Um, that trip uh, that she uh, took with her mother, however, proved to be her last. She wanted to return to Hollywood because she was a little worried that leaving Clark Gable to his own devices might not be such a good idea if you catch my drift. And so instead of taking a train, which her mother wanted to do, they decided to take an airplane and we all know what the result of that was. That airplane, airplane crashed into a mountain in Nevada, killing all aboard, including Carol and her mother. Um, after her death, she received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but upon her death, uh, President uh, Roosevelt honored her by posthumously awarding her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And she became known as the first American woman killed in the line of duty in World War II. Despite her concerns about Clark Gable, it was always rumored that he was madly in love with her until the day he died. And even though he married after her death, when he died, he made sure he was buried next to her. This is her home, it still stands. Um, it's a pretty cute little shingle style home. Um, it's got a nice little turret right here, but the pretty thing about this home is the little frieze underneath the turret. Um, it's painted a nice little color and it's, it's really a pretty little feature. Um, this was uh, for a long time, a bed and breakfast in Fort Wayne, but it is now owned as a private residence. And if you take our West Central ghost tour, it is featured on our ghost tour. Isn't that pretty? Next, Philo Farnsworth. The house that Philo Farnsworth lived in and, and his reputation in Fort Wayne is probably one of the greatest misconceptions in Fort Wayne history. Jill Downs points this out every time you talk about Farnsworth because she did the National Register nomination for the home and thank you, Jill. Um, people misperceive that Fort Wayne is where television was invented. That is wrong. Don't ever say that, it's wrong. He did build a, or he did live in a house at 734 East State Street, but the home is not only famous as being his home. So. Where really is the truth? Well, the truth is that in 1927, Farnsworth submitted a patent for an electric television system, thus becoming the inventor of television. But that happened in his lab in San Francisco. It did not happen in Fort Wayne. And if you see the little box over here on the left, I want to draw your attention to the little circle deal right there. Okay, so in 1927, the very first image that was ever transmitted on television was the image of the woman in that circle. In 1939, Farnsworth moves to Fort Wayne takes over a radio, local radio company called the Cape Heart Radio Company, then turns it into the Farnsworth Television and Radio Corporation. And that's when televisions began to be manufactured in Fort Wayne. So the truth here is the TV was invented in San Francisco. It was manufactured in Fort Wayne. So he really decided that he liked inventing a lot better than manufacturing. So he lived here a year and then moved away. Then he came back in 1948 and purchased the house that we're gonna talk about. And there he lived until 1967. 
Um, this guy is really pretty impressive. This is not the only major thing he ever invented. He was also uh, responsible um, for the traffic control system that we have today. And by the time he died, he had over 300 patents to his name. Um, the house that we're gonna talk about, however, there you go, still standing. The house we're gonna talk about, however, is not only famous because of him. This is a really sweet little house and it was first lived in by a guy by the name of Daniel Nine, who was an attorney. Now, those of us who love architecture and really uh, are, are gung-ho for things that women did, this house was designed by his sister-in-law, Joelle Nine, who was one of the very first female architects in the entire country. And she designed a ton of houses in Fort Wayne, including a lot of homes in the Wildwood Park subdivision. So she designed this home that her brother-in-law lived in. This is actually a side view of this house. So it's lived in first by a nine. Then in 1913, um, a guy by the name of Franklin Mead moves into this house. He worked for Lincoln National, but that really is not why he's important. He's really important because he is an internationally known horticulturist. And for all of us who garden, this guy was the bomb. So he moves into this house and builds amazing gardens. The house at one point is actually called Iris Crest because he has a collection of irises, daylilies, daffodils, and other flowers that are amazing. In fact, in 1925, he invents a hybrid daylily called the Hyperion. The Hyperion, some of the varieties of that for people that garden are the Stella de Oro, which almost everybody that has a daylily in their entire yard will have a Stella de Oro daylily. This guy invented that hybrid. When he died in 1933, his obituary stated that he had one of the finest gardens in the country. And it was so amazing that the irises, daffodils, and lilac bushes in his yard were donated to the city of Fort Wayne and became the basis for the Foster Park Gardens that we now have today. So let's talk a little bit about the house. It was built in 1910 and it is a combination of craftsman and colonial revival architecture. Um, this is the front. So the gable on the house is in the front, but it has some nice craftsman details. These wide overhanging eaves, uh, the shed dormer, those are both craftsmen, but it's colonial revival in the treatment of the front door. There's a nice pedimented arch and there's side lights, side windows, and a nice uh, kind of a fan kind of shaped light over the, um, over the front. So that house still stands today. The National Register uh, nomination was um, done by Jill Downs and it became uh, a part of the National Register in 2013. Now, another picture. Now, my personal favorite, the Noel Mansion. The Noel Mansion, I think, probably represents the greatest tragedy in Fort Wayne architectural history. This was a beautiful mansion and some people call it the mansion built by cough syrup. This particular house that we're gonna talk about was basically built using money made by the sale of a cough syrup that it would be both illegal to make or buy today. In 1905, William Knoll graduated from college, went to work in his father Benedict's drug store and at that point took a cough syrup concentrate that his father was selling and worked it into what we see here as the Pinex cough syrup concentrate. This concentrate was meant to be mixed with corn syrup or honey or something like that and then used, I don't know if you can see it or not, but as you start to work your way through the ingredients, the main ingredient in Pinex cough syrup was chloroform. Chloroform is now banned by the FDA as an ingredient in anything ingested by people. So 
This particular cough syrup and the marketing of which made the Knowles wealthy people, uh, allowed them to create a real estate empire, and the most notable of which was their mansion that we are going to talk about. But this cough syrup concentrate ended up being marketed from coast to coast and around the world. But first, before the Knowles made lots and lots of money, they lived in this pretty uh, little um, Queen Anne style house in West Central. This house still exists. It's at 1235 West Barry. So no Noel built this wife for himself and his wife, Laura, in 1906. But the other thing he did is he was also one of the developers of the landing. And this is the Pinex building. And look at this building, because this stuff still exists. And I got these, I think, from Randy Harder. A million thanks, Randy. Um, if you look at the Pinex building, and I think it's like right across from Nawa, you will see that this is a P. They act, he actually built the building with the letters of Pinex cough syrup in the building. And in 1914, he moved his offices there. The address is 123 uh, West Columbia, the landing. Um, so he put his office into that building. But before he built this house, he also, in 1912, purchased an entire block of real estate at the corner of Washington and Calhoun, which we know as, as the Schmitz block. But he also built a new building right around the corner on an empty lot on West Washington, known as the Blackstone Building. These are all now part of Midtown Crossing. But he built the Blackstone building so that his wife could have a little play job running an exclusive women's clothing store. And for older Fort Wayne people, some of the stores that were in this block included Nobson's and Hutner's when there were still stores like that downtown. But probably the most amazing thing I know of built in the city of Fort Wayne was the Noel Mansion. Um, he purchased a lot in 1914 for $25,000 at the corner of Fairfield and Meyer Road. And he uh, then hired Charles Weatherhog to design a 28-room limestone Italian Renaissance Revival mansion. And in 1918, the family moved into this house. You will recognize Charles uh, Weatherhog as an architect because he also was the architect for Fairfield Manor and the Masonic Temple. This house featured a first floor ballroom with murals painted on site by an artist imported from Italy. A fabulous curved mahogany staircase. And apparently what happened here is this part of the staircase is, is the handle rail is painted red and it matches the velvet rail that runs up the wall. So those both match. This is all one of the murals painted on site by an Italian artist brought by Noel from Italy. Uh, the house had a marble staircase, marble floors, 10 bathrooms, walnut and cherry paneling, leaded glass domed ceilings, I love, this is my favorite, a master bathroom shower. And I think it must have been, if you know what a rib cage shower is, you stand in the shower and instead of there being this, it goes around you like you're standing in a rib cage. So you don't have to move and it gets you all the way around your whole body. It had 17 shower heads, two of which sprayed perfume. It had a third floor gaming room with roulette wheels and gaming tables. It was surrounded by three acres of manicured gardens, a reflecting pool, a garden, a swimming pool, and a tea house. The entire thing was surrounded by a wall. The furnishings in the home cost over a million dollars at a time when the average house cost 3,500 and the entire courthouse was built for $200,000 less than that. So here you're seeing the uh, grand staircase. You're seeing a side view. This I believe is the front door right here. It had beautiful wrought iron on the front of it. 
So a few years after this, this guy's got so much money that he buys an oceanfront home for $165,000 on Miami Beach on what was called Millionaire's Row. But if you, I guess the sad part of all of this is just because you've got money, it doesn't really mean things go the way that you would like them to. Um, I have to point out that he didn't live real long. He died in 1941. Um, his son died at the age of 36 in his desk working at the Pinex building. His daughter, Virginia, died at 50. His other son, Jack, died at 52. So these people are million, 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 million bajillionaires, and none of them really live long enough to enjoy anything. Um, the Pinex company was sold to Revlon in 1959 and in 1960. This mansion, over a million dollars when it was built, is sold to a church for 165,000 bucks. By 1974, the church can't afford it. They think it's gonna cost $300,000 to repair it. So the house is demolished and all that's left standing today is a parking lot with the carriage house in the back. And what's really sad is a wealthy Wells County businessman buys the entire marble limestone facade of this house, intending to use it, puts it in a field outside Bluffton, dies, and it's still sitting there. And when people wonder why we advocate for historic preservation, that house is a perfect example. And last, but whoops, last, I, I love this picture. This was the only picture we could find of William Noel. This is him looking dapper in his white slacks outside his $165,000 millionaire row property in Miami Beach, and this is the house. So he owns part of the landing, part of Midtown Crossing, the nicest house in town, and a huge millionaire mansion in Miami. Last but not least, the Snyderman home. Um, this is a picture of Michael Graves. Michael Graves is a Hoosier architect born in Indianapolis, Indiana. In 1972, a local doctor, Sanford Snyderman and his wife, Joy, hired Michael Graves to design a home for them in Southwest Fort Wayne. It was a really nicely 40 acre wooded area off West Jefferson Boulevard. It takes them five years to build this home and it becomes known as a national icon of modern architecture. Um, the house consists on, on the outside. Oops, there's my pointer. There, you see this kind of white cage-like thing? It's it first consists of that white cage-like exterior, which is, which is pretty typical um, of Graves' early projects but it also contains inside the structure, the correct color of this is gray, these gray planes right here, and then the terracotta that wraps around. And this is um, probably more typical of his later work. It also has some smaller expanses of glass in it. And so this particular house is known as a transitional piece for Graves architecture because it combines both earlier and later work. It also has both interior, I don't know if you can see them, but it has an interior set of staircases plus an exterior set of staircases. So Graves' plan was that you should be able to get to different rooms in the house in many different ways. There's balconies, balconies that cantilever over the side. Um, the roof line has things that extend up like this. So it's really a pretty cool house. Um, there is in the home or was in the home, this mural down here, which I just find to be fabulous. That was a, a mural both designed and painted by Graves that hung in the dining room. This is the dining room table right here. This is the living room, just so you can see what the house looked like on the inside. Um, that particular mural is now in the Indianapolis Art Center, which is an art center designed by Michael Graves. Um, this particular home 
um, after it was built, one of the Snyderman's sons was interviewed for an architectural magazine and him describing this house sounds like every person who ever lived in a Frank Lloyd Wright house. I mean, the comments I could be identical. So he says, it wasn't a particularly physically comfortable house to live in. It was cold in the winter, it was hot in the summer, it had a flat roof that didn't drain. In fact, even building the home was a problem. Um, this home was so avant-garde for its time that they had difficulty finding um, construction people to even build the home. And Dr. Snyderman ended up functioning basically as the contractor for the building of the home. Um, and so that's why it took years and years to build. A um, little bit about Graves. He was born in 1934 in Indianapolis and he is considered to be one of the United States most outstanding modern, modern architects. Uh, he received an American Institute of Architecture award for his work, um, but he's also known, and I don't think I have a picture of it, um, but he's also known for um, designing mass produced um, pieces of, of of everyday things that are exceptional. You will know him probably the best for the little silver uh, teapot that was marketed at Target and a bajillion people bought Graves teapots. So what happened to this house? Well, um, first of all, you're probably wondering about this picture. Um, although she never lived in that home, um, Dr. Snyderman and his kids and wife were pretty well known locally, but their daughter was Dr. Nancy Snyderman, and she was known to a lot of us through the 2000s because of her work both as a medical correspondent for ABC and the chief medical editor for NBC. When, you, when any of the morning programs, like in her case, the Today Show or the NBC Nightly News, want to ask questions that you ask of a medical person, that was Dr. Nancy Snyderman for about 15 years. Um, she did that work until 2015. And I find this story very interesting because if you like history, it repeats itself over and over and over and over again, which is why people that love history love it. So in 2015, she goes to Africa. She gets exposed to the Ebola virus. She comes back, she's supposed to quarantine for 21 days. Do you think she quarantines for 21 days? No. So she doesn't quarantine for 21 days. Everybody finds out about it. The controversy is huge. She ends up resigning and now lives uh, on a small ranch in Montana. Um, the house we're talking about though is sold by the Snydermans in 1999. And at that point, I think this house was probably the proverbial money pit. And it was sold to developers who were gonna tear it down and uh, divide the property that it was built on and put some kind of modern subdivision uh, there. However, there was a huge outcry from architects and historic preservationists about the loss of this home because its architecture is just so significant that the city got involved and the demolition of the house was placed on hold. However, this particular house, we never got to see what was gonna eventually happen to it. Um, because an arsonist lit fire to it in 2002 and it burned to the ground. And Michael Graves died in 2015, so he was no longer available to do any rebuilding at all. So, before I do questions, which I will always take, um, for those of you who have attended my lectures before, it takes a village for Karen Richards to do a lecture. Um, so I want to first point out that Arch is fabulous. Laura, hi Laura. Laura was fabulous. Many, many, many thanks. And so was Connie. I'm technologically challenged as those of you who know me well know. Um, and they were really helpful. So was Mike Galbraith. Randy Harder in the back, you're a gem. Thanks again for all your help on this. I got a lot of information from the History Center, the Allen County Public Library, Jill Downs. Um, found some great old Quest Club uh, papers written by Dr. Jeffrey Raymer and Tony McNair and some architectural work by a woman by the name of Suzanne Stevens. So for all the people that helped me put this together, many, many, many thanks. Um, does anyone have any questions? That presupposes I could answer them. <laughs>
Thanks, all, thanks also to Karen for giving us another wonderful lecture. Do we have questions? Any here from the room? Any from our viewing? It will be, it's been, it's been recorded, it's being recorded, and it will be posted on the ARCH website to be viewed at your convenience. And it really helps for those of you who aren't members to become members of ARCH. If Connie doesn't do this, I always do. I really Belonging to ARCH is a, an incredibly inexpensive thing to do, and you help us in our preservation efforts. So hopefully when we give lectures like this in the future, I don't point to things that look like the Noel Mansion and say they're no longer with us. Our members make it possible, as I said earlier, and we'll say again. Yes, sir. You know, like I said, I personally pick my favorites. The Bass House was built more in the era of the Knoll Mansion. Um, and I guess out of all the people, I, I consider some of the, I also looked at the contributions of the person and I really considered the contribution of, of Noel to be a little bit more significant. But, you know, frankly, there is enough and there are enough houses and people out there. I could easily do version two of, of this particular one. And if you wanna know one interesting piece of information about that house, that house was built by the same crew of workers that built the Dodes mansion up the street, which is that uh, Greek uh, plantation style looking white wood house up Bass Road. They shared the same sets of workers on both those houses. And the only reason I know that is I stupidly attempted to buy the Dodez Mansion once, so found out all of this great information. <laughs> well, we'll keep that idea in mind of, of version 2.0 of, of, this, of this talk, because there are so many historic houses. Um, questions from our viewing audience? We didn't have any. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Then I will make my one last set of thanks to Karen for presenting this lecture. Once again, Arch thanks Arts United of Greater Fort Wayne, the Community Foundation of Greater Fort Wayne, for their support of our lecture series and our community education programs. And we invite you to visit our website, archfw.org, to become a member and to help us do this in the future and to support all of our community education work. And thanks again to the History Center for making all of this possible, including the recording, which will go up soon on our um, website. Next lecture. Next lecture will be the third Saturday of May. It will be Karen again with um, memories of the flood of 1913 and the difference it made in Fort Wayne. Thank you again for coming. I really love having live people. I can't talk to myself in an empty room. So thank you so much. Thank you very much.